Okay, so let's uh, let's go back to our uh, category stuff. Um, uh, so I wanted um, to speak about groups, and um, groups are particular kind of monoids where every ob every uh, element has has an inverse. And um, uh, Actually, it would be nice to be able to speak about morphisms that are in invertible in, in any category, not just categories with one object. And actually, we have everything we need to speak about uh, inverses in a category, uh, because what you actually need for this definition to work, you need to have the composition and the unit. So we have everything to speak about inverses in, a, in an abstract category C. So if you have a morphism uh, F from object A to B, and uh, you would want to uh, find its inverse, so it it should be a map that goes the other direction such that uh, this composition f composed with g which is which is a map on a uh, f composed with g would be equal to identity of a yes this is this is one part of this definition that we have here and the other other one is is here on b if you take uh, morphism um, the other way. So first you go G and then F, that this should be an identity f over B. And this is uh, kind of very, uh, uh, very important r relation to a morphism to be an I, which we call an isomorphism. Because um, um, in, in any setup you, you'll come up with, like if you come up with, with two groups, uh, like in a category of groups, if you'd come up with an isomorphism of groups, then what this isomorphism means, that any kind of uh, property that a given group ha has, that its, its isomorphic image also has this kind of property. That's, let's say that this group has only five elements. Uh, then this isomorphic image, this, this, this B, also will have only five elements. And this is because uh, morphism of groups are just s set morphisms and, and this will be actually isomorphism on the set level. And on the set level, isomorphisms preserve uh, the number of elements. So um, if you have Um, if in the category of set, if you have two sets, A and B, um, that they are isomorphic, isomorphic uh, if and only if their cardinality is equal. Uh, so if, if they are finite set, it, it means that they have the same number of elements. Uh, and in, in one direction, uh, it's quite, um, quite easy. So if you have an isomorphism from, from, from B to A, and which means that you have, you have this inverse map uh, from, 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 B, from B to A, uh, this, this actually, uh, this property in the category of sets is equivalent to, to two things. Uh, first, that the map F is, uh, is onto, which means uh, that for every B, for every B, there exists an A such that B is an image of something. Uh, 
And how to show it? It's, it's quite easy because uh, if you take B, B and you want to find this A, so take, take its image here, G of B, and now this G of B will be mapped to B. So this G of B is this, is this A that we're looking for. That means that if you have isomorphic sets, this isomorphism has to be onto. But it has also another property that if you have uh, A and A prime such that F of A is equal to F of A prime, then A is equal to A prime. So uh, it's, it's usually called one to one that it doesn't glue anything, which, which also it's easy to prove from, from this definition because if you have, so we have, we have the set A here and we have B here and we know that F brings, brings this A and A prime to something to the same element, let's call it B. But then if we compute G of B, it, it, will, it will has to be equal to both A and A, A prime, just because this composition is an identity. You see? So if I go from, if I take A, B, and they then come back, I should come back to A because of this definition that if I go F and G, I go to itself. And the same for A prime. If I go to, from A prime to B and then come back, I must come to A prime. So, so these elements must be equal. Uh, so in, in the category of sets, this is a perfect description. What is, what is an isomorphism? So if you have an isomorphism, it always has these two properties. And, and the other way around as well, if, if you have a map with these two properties, you always can construct the, the, the inverse because it, it actually tells you how to construct it. It tells you to take this B, um, uh, so uh, if we want to construct it, we, we have this F, and if we have a B here, we, we now know that for, from the first property, we know that it comes from some A, that there exists an A such that it, it is mapped onto it. And from the second property, we know that such A is, a, is unique. So it actually, we have well-defined map from, from B to A, where for every B, there exists only a, one A. This is, this is a property a map has to satisfy. And this will be the, the inverse by construction. Um, in what about modular operation? Hmm? What about modular operation? Uh, These elements won't be unique, but they will yield the same result. Uh, Yes, and this map will be will be onto, but will not be one to one. So it will not be an isomorphism. Um, and um, and this description will work in actually quite quite many categories like groups, monoids, um, which are built on top of the category of sets where you take sets with additional structure. Mm -hmm. but, but it will not work for, for, for a generic category because we speak about elements of a set. So in, in, in general formulation, we didn't have access to, to that level of information. We know that we have a set of objects, but we don't know how the objects are, uh, are created. What, what are their, what's their internal structure? And because of that, we cannot, we cannot uh, specify these this two properties uh, 
in this way, if we want to, if we want to do that uh, in a general setting. So let's try, let's try to, to uh, rewrite it in, in some way that will, will free us from the elements. So uh, if we have a set, and an element and an element of it. Can we represent it as an arrow? Any any ideas? Um, identity. Mm. So this will not capture the A. Uh, a constant. So you want to take this and map it to like a one point set? that will forget every information we have. But what if we actually reverse this arrow and take this re re one point that we only have and map it to A? It's, it's actually a nice arrow. So um, can, we, can we actually rewrite this definition Let's say this one. I'll start with this one for some reason first. Um, in terms of arrows. Um, so we say here for, for every element. So if we take our, s we have our set A, and let's say uh, we take any, any two elements, so we need two arrows. Mm -hmm. And then we, we take the arrow from A, A to B. Uh, and and what's, the, what's this property? F of A equals to F of A prime, how to translate it here on this diagram. Let's call this E A and E A prime. And this is F. So, uh, so the picture here is like that, that this is, this is A and this is B. And this goes to A, this goes to A prime. And this goes to B. Yeah, this is this is ex exactly what we speaking here about. So we actually want to say that F composed with E A is equal F composed with E A prime. This is this is this part. Okay. And then. A is equal A prime. Ah, so A is actually the same as this funny arrow EA. So it means that EA is equal to A, EA prime. Okay, so well, we are almost there. Uh, like uh, we can be just much more generic and uh, and forget that we took very special set and kind of special arrows and be much more uh, um, have, a, ha, have a condition that is stronger that says for, for every two arrows such that the composition with, with F, uh, let's call this arrow A and J, uh, from a prime to b, such that if if this composition is equal, so if f composed with with i is equal to f composed with uh, j, then i is equal to j. And now this definition doesn't really speak about any elements. We're like free from the internals in any way. And, and this is a definition that 
category theory uses for in kind of injectivity, which we called uh, monomorphism. Uh, it has a different name because in some categories it's not equivalent to, to, to this definition. In category of sets, these two definitions are, are actually equivalent. Uh, so morphism of sets are monomorphism only if they don't glue elements. But category theory is just point-free set theory. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, because we don't want to speak about the internals uh, if we don't have to. So uh, now how to specify the other definition? That is, um, I, I could just say that uh, reverse the arrows and, and that's it. And that's actually what we'll cut what we'll, we'll come up with in, in a second. Uh, so in this condition we have, we want to say that every element is, is in the image. So th like the, that the image is, the image of A spans everything. So um, if you have a B, and and let's say that your map f go, goes only to a subset of b only only to this, this part um, then then what you could uh, you, you could construct maps uh, from this set b uh, um, to a set that just has two elements, 0 and 1. And one map would map this, this to 1 and this to 0, and, and the other uh, would, would do the, uh, it differently. And then you could see that the compositions are not actually equal of, of these two maps. They're, uh, but if, the, if, this, if this inner thing is, is whole B, it, it will be actually true. So if, if you have a map from, from A to B and for every two arrows, every two arrows, uh, let's call this i and j, you have uh, this condition that a j f then i equals j. That actually means that this f maps onto every element of b. And that's kind of dual condition to, to, the, to the other one. And, and again, this, this is a nice description, th this, this point wise uh, description here is kind of nice in, in categories that are built on top of set, like set, group, monoids, but it doesn't work in, in more general context where, where this condition is more appropriate. But uh, on this generality we, we actually lose something. It's not anymore true that something which is an epi and a mono is, is an isomorphism. That's only true in the category of sets. But there are categories in which you have monomorphism, which are epimorphism, and still they, they are not uh, isomorphism of, of objects. Um, OK, that's, uh, that's this part. OK, next. Uh, Next example of an interesting category that, that you also know a little bit about is, uh, is categories that come from uh, orders, like partial order sets. And um, 
so in Haskell, there is ORT class that captures this property. And um, ordered sets. So partial all ordered sets are, are sets uh, with, with a relation. Uh, it's a relation on P, uh, and this relation satisfies uh, three properties. Uh, and these are the constraints that are written in ORT class, like the... Um, so for, for every element of P, uh, always P is less and equal to P. Uh, which is called re reflex reflexivity. Um, then um, then for any el two elements, if you have p, p is, is less than q and, and q is less than p, then you should have that p is equal to q. Uh, and the third axiom that is uh, very important is that if you have uh, three elements p q w then then it should be transitive so p should be less equal than w and there there are many interesting partial ordered sets um, so maybe why they are called partial anybody knows what's What's the meaning of a partiality here? here? You don't have to have relation between all the elements. Yes, exactly. So you can have you can have an order that doesn't capture this relation between some of the elements. And the, the, the simplest example is if you take zero and one, well they have to be somehow com comparable, but if you if you take two additional elements, let's, um, let's call it A and B, and the, and the relation is such that zero is, is less than, than B, B is less than one, and the same here. But you don't say what's, what's the relation between A and B. Um, and this is like the basic block of the partiality that, that you get inside posets. Um, and a poset is called total, or, or the order is called total if, if every two elements are, are comparable, like, like in natural numbers, uh, where for every, every two numbers, you always know which one is smaller than the other. Um, so it's... That is equal. There is no separation. Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, so just the fact that you have equality, does that make it partial? Uh, no, like in, in, in mathematics, equality is for free given. It's not like in Haskell, where you have to have E class given for your type. But in mathematics, you always can say if something is equal to something else. Okay. Like in anything that is built at least on top of set theory, maybe in, uh, in contexts which uh, are not based on, on, on sets, mm -hmm. which there are, uh, you may, may not have it for free. Like in toposes, which are built on top of categories, some because particular. You can always say something equal to itself. Uh, yeah, in this setting, yes, you always know you always know what you're dealing with because this is kind of set with of something, and you know if like this is not really considered by mathematicians even. <laughs> That's quite funny. Um, okay, and and actually every partial order set. Is 
is a is a category in a in a very particular way. You can uh, so if you have a such diagram, you can actually it's almost look like an arrow, no? <laughs> we all only we're missing the trivial parts, so the identity arrows. But yeah, you would not normally write them because it's it's too obvious. So um, and if you have natural numbers, yeah, you have a you have a perfectly well-defined uh, category, and you have an arrow from zero to three as well, because this is the zero is l less than three. If you do it like this, and you say like these outer two are equal, do you then like mean that should there be like arrows that both ways? Yes, exactly. Right yeah, exactly. And and you see that this only can happen if if you have the same element. Um, and, and because of composition, it should also be an arrow from the bottom one to the top one. Like uh, yes, so it's but the, the, the two arrows one side and the other. Yes, and you can you can you can see that the composition is actually hidden here. Right. That th this gives you the composition. And. Uh, and you, you can actually um, say which categories look like that. These are exactly the categories which have uh, at most one arrow between two objects. That between two any objects, like one. there exists at most one arrow. There can't be one back. No. But then what about the left and the right points in that square? That's only the identity arrow. That's a, because they're the same point. Yes. Right. Yeah, exactly. Values, but now we're looking at internal values. No, we're not. Objects, are we <laughs> no, our our internal values are our objects. Mm -hmm. But we're not looking what is inside zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Um, okay. Some some other constructions that that are very well fa fa familiar to all to you because they are the basic of, of uh, algebraic data types. Um, so sums and products. Um, so maybe let's start with products. It's maybe easier. Um, so in the category of sets, if we take sets A and B, we can we can take the product set, which consists of pairs A and B, where A in A and B in B. Um, but that's again not a nice definition from from categorical perspective because we are we will not generalize this for any category. So the question is what. What is a universal property uh, that this thing satisfies in terms of arrows? Uh, so, so uh, let's see what we actually have when, when we have the product. If we have A times B, uh, so we have, we have this pair A, B, what can we do with it? Exactly, we can get A or we can get B. And this is the only thing we can actually do for if you, if, if you would consider the category of Husk and the type which is the product, this is only two arrows you can construct uh, forgetting about 
uh, like undefined and things like that. Um, so actually this, this A times B is kind of best approximation of, of this situation. If you take any, any set C with two maps from, uh, from C to A and C to B, let's call this F and G, then what can we do? Can we do something? Can we define a program here somewhere that is not written yet? How? So we take C and we map to what? I don't hear. So we need A and B. So we get A using F and we get B using G. Um, so the one million dollar question is, can we have another map such that, because this map is quite pa particular, because if you go here and then project, then you, then you get F. Okay, so, so this, these two diagrams here commute. And, and the question is, can we get any other map that behaves like that? Is there? Or maybe there isn't. Yeah. It's only one such map. Because we said what it, it, how it behaves on, on both uh, coordinates. Like there is no any freedom. So now we can actually forget that we're we're speaking somewhere about elements. That if you have A and B, the product is something with this property that for for any any the product which is this new object with these two arrows is something that if you have anything, any other thing like that, it will has a, have a unique map. OK, that's a nice definition. But is it, is it a good definition? Is it well defined? Is it this thing uh, unique? Like can we, maybe we can, maybe in a general category, we can have two such things. That will not be, uh, that would not be nice. And actually, in the category of sets, you could take A times B, which is this, but you could actually take, like for a finite, for a finite sets A and B, you could take any other sets that have, that has A times B elements as this A times B and construct this map and, and be fine with this. But we'll fine with that because any, any sets like that are, are isomorphic to, to A, A times B. And this definition works well up to isomorphism. So in, if, you have, if you have a category C and you define and you have objects A and B, objects of C, and you define A times B uh, with these two projections, P1 and P2, as this object with this property that for every, every C and every two arrows, there exists a unique arrow, then what I claim that if you have another such object, let's call it um, A, 
a times b prime then they must be isomorphic so that will be a very very nice categorical proof a very simple one but nonetheless categorical because we will not speak about elements only only about arrows so what we know about this a and b and a b prime is only this this property that they have this unique arrows so we can we can look that this a times b has this property so if you think about c as this a times b so what it gives us Yeah, exactly. So we have this map. Uh, and this situation is kind of symmetric. So we also have the other arrow by the same argument. So let's call this F and let's call this G. So these are our candidates for, for isomorphism. But now we need to prove that F composed with G is an identity, and G composed with F is identity. Yeah? And we still only have this property that, that is written here, that there is this, this map must be unique. Um, so, okay, let's, let's try to write what we have. Um, This is uh, F, no, G composed with F. G composed with F. So we have a that diagram like that. We, we take F composed with G with the projections, and um, this was pi 1, pi 1, pi 2 by two. Um, so first thing to ask is, is this diagram commutative? Does this F, sorry, this F composed with G composed with pi two, is it equal to pi two? We have to, we, we have to prove something like that. But it's, it's written here. Um, so if we take G and F composed with pi 2, so it's this arrow, Okay, so we have, um, we want to consider this map. So we take G composed with F composed with pi 2. So G has this property, no, F, F has this property that F composed with pi 2 is, is this map. So this map is actually equal to this map. But this map, from the property that we we, we written here, is is equal to, to this map. Ah, this is pi two. So this this part commutes, and this commutes in the same way because there's no difference. So what? So this map is unique. We know that this map is, must be unique. Do you know any other map that fits here? Uh, 
Yes, identity. So, what, what's the conclusion? It must be identity. Done. So, yeah, we, we'd have to now prove the other one, but, but that's the same. So, let's skip this. So, we know that this product is, is well-defined up to isomorphism. And that's why isomorphisms also are so important, because in categories, everything is up to isomorphism at best, or it's always up to isomorphism. Um, even even if, if a category is, is looking for different categories, how, how if they are the same, or if they should be treated the same, is also kind of up to isomorphic objects. That they are not that important uh, to have many different copies of the same thing. Um, Okay, so, so this is a construction, categorical construction of a product. And it said, theory, it works like that, that it's just a Cartesian product. Um, what it would look like in category of monoids? So now our A and Bs are monoids. And we want to construct this a times B as a monoid. And actually, in, in for monoids, this, this will be, you can define monoid structure on A times B, wh which there is an instance actually in Haskell for that, where you take the product and you, you take monoid on both legs of the, of the product. So this, this gives you well-defined monoid here. Then this projection is a monoid map. It preserves mul multiplication because it just forgets about one leg of the product. And whenever you have, whenever you have a, a, a pair of maps from, from a monoid, F and G, there also exists this unique map which is defined in the same way underneath, which is a monoid map. And from what we proved that here, that this will be actually a product in the, in the category of monoids. And the same will, will work in, in category of groups. Uh, or every category that has kind of algebraic structure on top of sets. So like groups, rings, fields, and w whatever you come come up with like an algebraic-like structure that even can have more operations with other arity than two. So like take three elements and combine it into one or something like that with some axioms. Um, uh, as, as products which works like that that is actually lifted from the category of sets. Okay, so we have, we have products, we're missing, we're missing sums. So, any, any idea how to, how to define a sum? Okay, so we start with with A and B, and we want to have a disjoint sum, so something a little bit better than, than a union. Let's, let's write it as that, not using a, the set theoretical union uh, uh, union thing. And wha what relations we have between these two, these three things? Yes, and what can we hope for? Like, w what did we hope here for? That this was the best AB that sits on top of A and B. So this should be... 
So what it would be? Inverse. So what should I inverse? If I flip it, you'll, you'll see you'll see that part. Yeah. yeah? So uh, if I have C here, and I map A and B to C, then what 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 can I do? In a unique way. Yeah, and. And this is this is the definition which will work in set theory that this is the disjoint union of two sets. Uh, but it will not work in uh, well. Uh, if you take monoids, the, their disjoint union will will not be actually what you can construct out of the set itself. It will be something much bigger, because you take, uh, you have the set A, you take the set B, where you, and now you take the, the I took them disjoint, so th you take the, the disjoint union, and now you know how to multiply, ah, I know how to multiply A's, and I know how to multiply B's, but I don't know how to multiply something from here and something from here. So if I take this, this construction in the category of monoids, I will get something much bigger because it will also contain all the products of things from different sorts, how they are called in, um, in algebra. And... Um, Yeah, maybe we'll come back to, to this a little bit later, how, how to actually construct it, because it's nice to have some, uh, some machinery about uh, free, free monoids. Um, when we're looking at these diagrams, is there a way to know when you're looking at the diagram whether the structure, like the monoid, is preserved from the arrows? Uh, which, which? So like in the, in the product, we know that AB is a monoid and it's preserved, but in the sum it isn't. Is, is that indicated by the diagram? Um, something no, something, so, something you, you will actually expect for any kind of algebraic structure that the sum will contain much more because you need you need, for example, in monoids, you need the multiplications between the pairs. So you uh, expect that, that it will be bigger. Um, but in some categories, like in category of topological spaces, it will be just the sum of spaces, or the disjoint sum, like there will be. So in some cases, it looks really the same. But in algebraic setting, which is much more interesting for, 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 for Haskell, this this will be m a very different uh, object. Um, okay, so uh, so. To recap what we had already, we, we, we had a definition of a category that just consists of arrows with, with objects between, between the arrows map the objects. Uh, we had various examples, or like sets. Uh, we had examples from posets, from monoids, uh, and some universal constructions like A times B, the sum, and two two properties of morphism, the monomorphism, epimorphism, which are defined in terms, just in terms of arrows, and isomorphisms. And it would be nice, um, nice to also have kind of maps between categories. 
because this is often what uh, what mathematicians do after defining an object. Well, you go to a class about group theory. On the second lecture after groups, you will learn what are maps of groups. And the same for any, any other structures. What are homomorphisms between algebraic structures, which are maps which preserve the algebraic structures. And um, the same you would like to have here, that if we take two categories, uh, we would like to have something that we were able to map one to the other and see kind of relation, how they relate to each other. Mm. So let's see what, what do we have to take to, uh, to construct such a thing. So if we take two categories C and D, cuts, um, so we have in the in the category setting we always have two levels like that we have the level of objects and the level level of morphisms so we really would like to relate the objects from like have a map from objects of one category to objects of the other category and the same for morphisms so uh, from morphism of c from from an object, uh, let's call it A, B. To morphism of D. And we want to preserve all the structure we have. So what structure actually do we have? Uh, all, all the thing we have, if we have a, like this is in category C. If we have two objects and an arrow, it says uh, a few things. Like what one relation is that this arrow starts with, with A and ends with B. So if we want to map this arrow to something, we would like to preserve this relation, this source and target thing, which means that if we take on the level of morphism, if we take a morphism like this F and we map it to D, we actually want want it to, to be combined with this f on the level of objects. So this should be an uh, arrow from f of a to f of b. So this is, this is one thing that we want to preserve. Another thing that we want to preserve is this identity thing. So if we have identity of object a, which belongs to morphism from C A A, you would like it to, to be mapped to identity of F of, of A, morphism of D, F A F A. So this is the second thing we want to preserve. And and probably the most important thing is that we want to preserve composition. So whenever we have a diagram, I write it here, um, F, G, and G composed with F, A, B, and C. If we have a, such a triangle, then if we map it with this f, and we have f of a, f of b, and here we have this f of f, and here we take f of c, f of g, and here we have two choices. We have this f of g composed with f, but we also have the, the other choice, which is f of g composed with f of f. And we really want them to be equal. So being a functor is actually preserving this kind of diagrams, preserving these triangles. It, it actually implies that it will preserve uh, 
the source and target and yeah identities you you want to preserve as well uh, so really important part about categories is that this it they, they are kind of algebraic structure where the like monoids but the mu multiplication is partial is only defined for for morphism that that have the same this middle part and you want to preserve it when you when you take a mapping from one category to the other and such things are called functors um, okay let's uh, let's try some examples Um, so uh, let's take a category with a single object and with with a monoid of endo endomorphism and let's take another category with a single object with another monoid of endo endomorphisms okay so the question is what is a functor from from this category th to the other one hmm? so wh what it has to do what it does to the point to the single object yeah it just kind of doesn't have any choice. So actually, everything we have here written about f, wh what are its property we want, will be about the morphisms. So what is this property here that is written? How it translates to a map of monoids? Because we, we end up with just a morphism from, from M to N. Let's call it F. Which is written here. This A and B are, are equal and are these single points. And it maps to F of A. Oh, we, we know what is F of A. It's the single point. This is the other point. So this, this part says we have a map from M to N and what are its properties? Um, so, so this part says if you take F composed with G so F times G in a monoid f of f times g equals f of g times f of f and the other part says take identity of this of this monoid and map it to identity of the other mon monoid so actually a functor here is a is a homomorphism of monoids so uh, f of m times m prime is equal to f of m times f of m prime and f of identity of m is equal to identity of n that's that's it and uh, if you want to have a homework think about what are morphisms between uh, posets what are functors between two posets And what are functors between two groups? Okay. Uh, so a, a quick notice. If your internet is wonky,